all very, very much for coming to the house of the Lord today. And so we do have a special guest. He is no guest, really. This is his house. And so this is God's house, but this is also Pastor Glenn's place in ministry. We love you, Pastor Glenn. We love you. God bless your soul. And so he fired up the first service. We know you're going to do the same in the sec- I'm going to stand right here and do my best to keep you entertained while he gets does something in life. There he is. All right. Oh, it's a song. You're going to sing a solo for us, I see. Okay. All right. I can get to the house in two seconds. Thank you, Pastor Tom. God bless you. So good to see all of you. Um, I do want to remind everybody that directly after, we are still having baptism, right? So you know it's a little cool this morning, right? Well, it's in the water will be a little cool. But I read that by 2 o'clock, it'll be 70 degrees. So I'm going to wind down about 145. (laughs) If you could just see everybody's face, you'd know why I do that sort of thing. Uh, Every time I say something like that, I get that same look like, is he kidding? I hope. So, you know, how many know that today is Palm Sunday, right? And do you know what we celebrate on Palm Sunday? The triumphant entry of Christ into the city of Jerusalem, riding on the donkey, coming in in peace, and uh, then bringing uh, triumph and victory to all of us. And that's what I should preach about today, but I'm not going to. Uh, But I am going to preach about how we can triumph in the Lord. You go along with me on that? All right, great. Um, Actually, I preached everything I know in the first service, so I'm going to just warm it up and pour gravy all over it and give it right back to you guys. I plagiarized this idea from Pastor Tom. I appreciate him very much for this, the one-sentence sermon. I'd never heard anybody do that before, but I think it's a great idea. If you don't take anything else home with you today in your mind, Be sure and latch on to this idea, the one-sentence sermon, this statement. Um, It doesn't bother me to plagiarize from him because he stole it from somebody else, I guarantee you. (laughs) And that's good. That was a good thing. It was okay. We can use what is good uh, from other people. Nothing wrong with that. And my one-sentence sermon is, the great I am is. The Bible tells us, That if we're going to please God, we have to believe that He is. Uh, Hebrews 11 and 6 says, For without faith it is impossible to please God. For those that come unto Him must, must first believe that He is, and then that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now this isn't in the Scripture, but I'm going to add it out of experience. Then you have to diligently seek Him. Okay, and if you do, great things happen in your life. Um, the whole, the Holy Father, the Great I Am, is so many things; it defies description. There's not enough time uh, in our lives to say everything that He is. A few of those is He's good, He's faithful, He's merciful, He's long suffering, He's kind, He's gentle, He's powerful, He's uh, knowledgeable, He's the Creator, He's God, He's loving, He's willing to help you in every situation in your life. He's not willing that any should perish. So I couldn't preach on all of those things, so I'm going to settle on one thing. I have written in my notebook three things that God is that I read almost every day. God is bigger than our dreams. God is stronger than our enemy. God is richer than our needs. So I had to settle on one of them, and I I settled for the first one. God, our God, is bigger. The great I am is bigger than our dreams. That's important, much more important than we most of the time realize. Uh, Let's go to Exodus 3.14. And if I don't have that, there you go. And so you know this story very, very well. Moses, the man of God, the great uh, prophet, the great man of God in the likeness of Christ, etc. The great deliverer, the great leader of Israel. Uh, Moses is in the Midian Desert. Uh, He has been there for 40 years because 40 years prior, uh, he had discovered that he was a Hebrew and not an Egyptian, and he went to be with the Hebrew people, and there he saw an Egyptian uh, hurting one of the 
uh, Hebrews, and he killed the Egyptian, and he got found out about, and he had to slip out uh, by night just as quick as he could because he knew that they would kill him for killing that Egyptian. And he being a Pentecostal preacher, you know what the three things a Pentecostal preacher has always got to be ready to do? Preach, pray, or leave town. And so he skipped out. And he ran to the desert, and he met these uh, young ladies, and, and uh, they introduced him to their father. He married one of them. And for 40 years, he's been a keeper of sheep, and he's followed sheep and goats around for 40 years in the wilderness. And one day as he's tending them, he walks across and he sees over here some ways off, he sees a bush that's burning, but it isn't being consumed. And he doesn't notice that to begin with, but pretty soon he thinks to himself, he looks back over at the bush and it's still burning and it should have been burned up. So he says, I better go investigate this. And he goes over and as he gets close, a voice comes out of the bush to him and it says, Moses. Now, that's not what God really sounds like. I have absolutely heard one time the audible voice of God. He didn't sound anything in the world like that. Uh, as a matter of fact, he was very, very soft and gentle. Uh, doesn't, he doesn't sound a bit like Charlton Heston, believe it or not. <laughs> However, it's okay, Charlton had a good voice. There's nothing wrong with that. He spoke to Moses, and he spoke to him about delivering the children of Israel, the Hebrews, from the Egyptian bondage. And he told him how all of this was going to be. And so Moses said, well, Lord, who shall I tell them when I go back to uh, Egypt? Who am I to tell these people is sending me? He says, you tell them the great I am. I am is sending you. That's all they need to know. I am. That's all we need to know is that God, the great I am, is. If we believe that He is, we believe that He'll do what He says He will do, that He can. He is powerful as He says He is, we can have the desire of our heart. Moses had a great dream, but he was 80 years old before he saw it begin, even begin to take place. I believe that Moses, when he was 75 years old and he'd followed those goats and sheep around uh, for 35 years, I believe it was going through his mind saying, if only I hadn't killed that Egyptian, if only I had stayed where I was and been a little more patient or a little more gentle, if only I had waited a while, instead of following these stinking sheep and hard-headed goats, I would be back in Egypt doing something anyway, seeing something accomplished. He had reached the point, I believe, I believe this not because the Bible says it, but because I know how people's minds work, even believers' minds work like this, and we believe sometimes when we don't immediately see um, the results that we're looking for, we believe evidently nothing good's going to happen. Nothing could be farther from the truth. As a matter of fact, the statement, if only, is one of the most dangerous statements you can make, especially when it comes to faith, because we are putting limitations of our vision on the power and ability of God. If only, a lot of people these days will say, if only I were younger, I would still be able to do this, that, or the other. If all others are saying, if only I were older, I would be able to get into this and be able to do that. Someone else is saying, if I were richer. Somebody else is saying, if I was better educated, or I, if only I was this or this or the other. Now, I know we're supposed to preach the same message twice, but... This is what you get for giving me two shots in one day, okay? So I want you to look at something. I have a little prop here. I didn't have this in the first service because Mary had me distracted. And I, after 49 years, she can still distract me, okay? I think that's pretty cool. I'm getting all the mileage out of that I can, Pastor. So anyway, I forgot to get this out of the truck. But I want to show you something. Just a little prop. You see this little, you know it's a bolt. Some of you would look at it and you'd know even what it's for, but the majority of you would have no clue. There is not much to this little bolt, okay? It cost, even in today's inflated prices, it cost $2.37. So it's not expensive. It's not really valuable. It sure ain't cool. 
And if you were standing on a street corner or even at a, a flea market trying to hand these out, most people that came by you would shake their head at you and say no, shrug their shoulders and walk on. And even the ones that took it, uh, just out of courtesy to you, the majority of them threw it in the nearest trash can thinking that guy has really flipped his lid. That thing doesn't appear to be very important, does it? If that was the only thing I had, I wouldn't have much, right? But wait till you hear what this does. This little $2.37 bolt, in case you don't know what it is, it's the drain plug out of an oil pan on a 2018 GMC pickup. Never used it before, okay? So it still don't sound like much, does it? All you do is when you get ready to change the oil, you take it out, and then when you hopefully when you get done, you put it back in. So it doesn't have a glorious life. It doesn't appear to be valuable. It isn't a cool item to have. But let me tell you, when it functions the way it's supposed to function, it keeps the oil in that engine that would cost between eight and $12,000 to replace if I didn't have it there. So the next time the devil is throwing every rock in the quarry at you, telling how you can't do anything, how insignificant you are, how unimportant you are, how God isn't on your side, how it's taking so long for you to get done what you want to get done, how your dreams are useless, how you're just dreaming daydreams or pipe dreams, and it's never going to come about. You remember that oil plug, and you remember that even if you're insignificant in this world, you have a purpose that is more valuable than anything you could think or imagine, and God will do more and bigger and better things with you than you can even dream. Somebody ought to glorify the Lord. One of my all-time favorite stories, I get choked up every time I tell it, is of a preacher in Scotland. And this is in about the 1820s, uh, along in that era. And he is preaching in one of the little smaller towns. It's a mill and a coal mine town. And the truth is, I don't even know the man's name. I've heard the story and been telling it for years, but I, I never even heard his name. But he was a preacher, and according to the story, wasn't much of one. A lot of people encouraged him, but they were always encouraging him to retire early. He was, his congregation grew steadily, but it was steadily growing less and less in size. Nobody liked him. He didn't visit people. He stayed to himself. He wasn't valuable in the community. Nobody uh, really appreciated anything he did. Everything seemed to be going bad. It was a terrible time. In 20 years of pastoring at the same church, he had one convert, and that was a little 12-year-old boy. And he just went through life in misery and nothing good happening and nothing coming of it. Oh, wait a minute, except for one thing. That little boy was David Livingston, one of the greatest missionaries of all time that opened up the dark continent to missions. He also helped uh, get started a movement that would end the slave trade around the world. You see, we don't always know what God is doing. We don't always feel important. We don't always see the glory right away. We don't always see the majesty that God has got His hand on. But when we are obedient to God, when we yield to God, God will give us the desire of our heart and give us more to do with than we ever imagined. Oh, by the way, I am Pentecostal. If you want to shout a little bit, it won't scare me a bit. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. God doesn't lead you to defeat. God will direct your path to fulfill the will that you have and the dream you have because that will in all probability came from Him. Let's look at another scripture, Psalm 21, 1 and 2. I got it in order this time. Libby, I, last time I got, him, got her all messed up. Luckily, she's a lot smarter than I am. The king shall joy in thy strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation. 
How greatly shall he rejoice. You have given him his heart's desire and has not withholding the request of his lips. Let me share something with you a lot of people never catch. The dream you have, the aspirations you have of doing things for God in the kingdom of God probably didn't develop in your mind alone. In all probability, God put it there. Philippians 2.13, watch this one. For it is God which works in you both to will, that's the desire, that's the dream, both to will and to do His good pleasure. In other words, God puts that dream of whatever it is that you're dreaming about, that you want to do, that you want to become, that you want to accomplish, God put that dream there, and the God that started that work in you will see it through. Let's look at Philippians 1 and 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Christ. God saved you. He'll keep you till the end. God gave you a dream. God gave you a desire. God gave you an unction. God gave you an aspiration to, I want to accomplish this. I want to do this. I want to see this happen. God will see it through. A few years ago, probably 20-something years ago, a friend of mine, um, a, a pastor, he was pastoring down in, in South Florida, sent me a, a video, a cassette tape. Remember those, right? So he sent me a cassette tape. It was a testimony of one of the men in his church who had been an alcoholic, an unbelievable alcoholic. I mean, destroyed everything he had, lost everything he had. Finally, he came to church where his wife had been going and praying for him for years, and he got saved, gloriously saved. After about a year, maybe a little more, uh, he came to his pastor and said, Pastor, my friends I used to go out drinking with and fishing buddies and all, they want me to go on a a deep sea fishing trip. It's going to be several days. We're going out on a boat all the way across uh, to the Honduran coast to fish. And I'm not sure I should because I know they're going to be drinking and I know the devil will be there. But he prayed about it and he said, well, I feel like I'm going anyway. And so they went on their fishing trip. They got over off the coast of Honduras. A bad storm came up. They had to go into port. It was Saturday evening. Uh, they spent the night there. He decided, well, I'm going to get up and go to church the next morning. Goes down to the dock and asks somebody about where there's a, a Pentecostal church. And they say, well, there's one little tiny church. Six or eight people is all that goes to it. An old man is pastoring up there. It's up on the hill. So he goes up. And as he gets there, he sees this old gentleman, probably about my age. And uh, he sees this old gentleman. He's got those crutches like uh, they used to have when you had polio, you know, with the clamps on his arm, and he can barely move around, and the man jumps up, gets on his crutches, walks over to him, starts talking to him, praising God, saying, uh, you're here, you're here. And the guy looks around and says, well, yeah, here, <laughs> this is me. He said, no, uh, you, you're come to preach. He said, no, sir, you don't understand. I'm not a preacher. I just came to have church with you. He said, yeah, but God told me that you were on the island and that you would be here today. God's been telling him. I forgot about this part. God had been telling this elderly man for about 12 years. He'd been preaching for 20 years, or praying rather, for 20 years. And about 12 years ago, God started saying, I'm going to send a man and you're going to have revival. Six months prior to that, God said, he's coming soon. The day that morning, God actually that Saturday evening, God told the old man, he said, he's here on the island. When he saw him walk up, he understood that he was the man. And the guy said, well, I don't know. I'm not a preacher, but I'll testify some and tell what God has done for me. And he started testifying. The first news you know, he's preaching. And the Word of God is just pouring out. And people start getting healed as they start praying. The old man that has walked with these crutches, he's had polio and various other diseases. His legs are twisted. His back is humped. And he's bent over. And his arms are twisted in. You could literally, on the tape literally hear the bones cracking and popping as his bones started straightening out as he threw the crutches away as uh, he was healed completely they stayed there for over a month having revival in that church of six or eight 
came to be about a thousand or so were healed and saved in this revival. What I'm telling you is God is bigger than our dreams, greater than our realization, and God wants to fulfill your dream in the same way He did those. Once again, departing from the earlier message, I want to share this with you. I, I thought about it, so I'm going to share some things. I know in uh, seminary they teach you you're not supposed to use personal references, but as it turns out, I didn't go to seminary. <laughs> so I want to share a couple of things with you. Personal experience is what teaches me what can happen, what God can do. Two years ago, next month, two years, May in 2020, uh, well, in March 2020, I, I had the privilege to go to the Philippines to, uh, for a crusade and revival, et cetera. Our, our, our trip was cut short by a week because of COVID. We came back, but we had a burning in our heart to help the people of the Philippines. They were struggling so terribly. So toward the end of May, we felt like we should take up some boxes of clothes and maybe a little food and a little money, if we could, uh, to send to them. And uh, I started praying, and I talked with Pastor Tom. I talked with Dennis and different ones about us receiving a special offering. We had, uh, I spoke to people about bringing in clothes. We had, if I remember right, I, I don't even remember right now, two or three boxes of clothes to send and uh, that part's irrelevant, but we came to church to receive an offering, and I, honestly, I was praying, God, we need about $300. We need about $300 to send this, these boxes off, and I believe you're big enough to give us $300 in an offering. I had a lot of faith. That was a good offering, I thought. We shared the need with our church here. We received an offering, but it wasn't $300. It was $5,200. Since that time, we have been spending, sending about $7,500 a year for food and in clothing and in boxes of things. They have been the people we're sending it to has been distributing it. There have been over 485 people saved through, through those ministries. As you saw a few weeks ago, we've been able to purchase a truck and three, uh, four rather, motorcycles or scooters for the people there. What I want to tell you is I never dreamed. I was praying for $300. God doesn't look as small as I do. His eyes are bigger. His ability is greater. His power is more wonderful than anything I can think or imagine. I never even thought that God would do all that much. Some, I'm not glorifying me. I'm telling you how little I think, but how great God is. A number of years ago, you're, you're familiar with the scripture in uh, Malachi that says, bring all the tithe into the storehouse. There might be meat in my house. Well, I was on a mission trip to a different place quite a number of years ago, and that scripture kept coming to me. I discussed it with a, a missionary friend of mine. Why am I thinking that over and over? It stuck in my head for about five or six years, maybe six or seven years. Uh, all the time I'd continually remember that. And then another idea came with me that there were a lot of, or to me, there were a lot of ministers that needed help. And I realized as a spirit witness on this that I had hit the nail on the head. And we started subsequently, we started what we call a freezer ministry. And I, as I prayed about it, the Lord impressed me. He didn't speak to me, but He impressed me to put a certain percentage of my income aside to do this. Now listen closely to this. I'm not glorifying me. There's no glory in me about this because I'm still thinking little. Even after all these years that I've been serving God, my mind still gets stuck in the little sometimes. But after <clears throat> it took nearly a year to save enough money to do the first three freezers. Those freezers were $200 a piece. It cost me for the first three, <clears throat> pardon me, it cost me $750 a piece to fill them up. 
when I called the district superintendent in Tennessee and told him what I had and what I was going to do, he said, well, I always knew you were crazy. I just didn't, didn't know how bad it was. I said, well, this is what God led me to do. So we took these freezers to them, and we had great testimonies. And, and then later on, in a dream, the Lord spoke to me, and I saw my boss, the guy I worked for for years, speaking to me and said, I've given you a food ministry. And so just yesterday, I got a text or an email from a missionary saying that we would like to have one of these blessings, and this is what we've been doing, missionaries and needy families and so on, if at all possible, one of these freezer blessings. When I take to that, that to him in the next week or two, it will be number 54 freezer that we've delivered. I'm thinking in twos or threes, God is thinking multiple. It doesn't end there. This is the good, good news about it. Listen to this. The first one cost $750 to fill. The last one I took cost $37 to fill it. What I'm telling you is that God's got more. God isn't limited by price. God isn't limited by anything. The more expensive it gets, the less expensive it will be to you because God will provide for whatever you need, whatever you want, whatever God needs to do. God will take care of your dream and my dream. God will fulfill if we get rid of the if only and say that God, the great I am, is. He's bigger. He's stronger. He's richer. He's more willing. He's more able. He can do what I never dreamed I could do. I should have been tell, telling you about Moses. Now, I quit 10 minutes early in the first one. I promise I won't do that again, okay? I should have been telling you about Moses all this time. We left Moses standing at the burnt, burning bush, barefooted in his mouth all wide open. It said he was astonished. And listen, folks, if you walk by a burning bush that isn't consumed and God speaks out of it, you're going to open your mouth too and lie. I promise. Moses is 80 years old when this happens. Most people, by the time they're 80 years old, they think, well, you know, I'm on the downhill slope and not much more I can do. A lot of other people think, well, you know, you're old now. You can't do much of anything. But let me assure you something. Whether you're 8 or 80, when God's hand is on you, you can do what God wants you to do. It doesn't matter how young you are. God has a work for you. I've seen people that were uh, only uh, preteens that were praying for people. I've heard I have a friend that tells how oil used to run out of her hands when she prayed for people. And God would heal them because she had faith in God. Simple, childlike faith. Understand something. God doesn't use if only. God simply uses if. If you believe. If you believe. You can have whatever you need from Almighty God. Moses is saying, well, I guess my time is about up. I won't have anything left. I'm not ever going to get to do what I wanted to do. But as you know, the story turned out different. Instead of thinking about Moses as a loser, instead of thinking about a shepherd in the wilderness, when we call the name of Moses or somebody mentions him, we think about bread raining down out of heaven. We think about the Red Sea parting. We think about water flowing out of a rock. We think about the lightning coming down on the mountain and Moses with the Ten Commandments. We think about a man of God that raises his hands and the arm, his army defeats the other army. We think about the power and the glory and the splendor. More people know the name of Moses than almost any other name in the world. As far as I can recall or as far as I can and discover the only name better known than Moses is Jesus Christ and friend they work together his time wasn't up God was just getting him and Israel ready so when you think about how insignificant you are when you think about how it's taking so long for anything to happen. I've prayed over and over and over. Understand something. God is preparing the way for you. And God sees the dream in your heart. The aspirations in your spirit. God sees what you're glorifying Him for. He sees what you want to do. And God will use you mightily and wonderfully. Doesn't matter what your education level is. Doesn't matter what 
what you look like, how old you are, where you came from, what you can do, or what you think you can't do. If you can believe, God can do. Amen. I guess I am going to quit early. You see, God's better to you than you realize. Worship team, if you'll come. (laughs) I do have plenty more to say, but there's no need to say it. I've told you everything that's important. Whatever your dream is, if you'll stand with us as they're coming. I want to put this in your mind. I want you to remember that God is, and God is bigger than everything you think you want. God is bigger than your dream. God's big enough to build a great church. God's built enough, big enough to use a small church. God can do. God will do. If you have a dream you've been praying for, a desire you want to do for God, or if you're not certain what it is, as our prayer team comes, our prayer warriors are great people. They know how to, how to get a hold of God. They know how to reach God with their prayer. God hears all of us as we pray, but He certainly hears these prayer warriors as they call on Him. If you have a dream that you want to see God help you fulfill, I want you to come and get with one of our prayer people. Let them pray with you. Let them help you. They're not going to get in your business. They don't have to ask personal questions or embarrassing questions. What they're going to do is help you pray, and God will convince you that He's going to help you with what you've been praying for as they play gently and softly here and as we look to that I'm also going to ask that if you are not saved today if you're not born again but you'd like to serve the Lord Jesus Christ and like to have him in your life I'm simply going to pray that you reach out to one of our prayer team they will pray with you the sinner's prayer Jesus Christ has already shed his blood for you he will deliver you whatever you desire Whichever way you want to go, that dream comes from God. And He is big enough, happy to fulfill that dream. God bless you. Would you come? Come. Don't be hesitant. Come right now. Whatever it is, doesn't matter. Our God is an all-consuming fire. He will do great things. He isn't just a God of yesterday. He is the eternal God. God bless you. Hello, everybody. Colonel Gray here. Just reminding you, check in the River Life social media like this. Hey River Life Church, Tom Golden right here. I have a tithe and an offering scripture to share today. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18 verse 16, a gift opens the way for the giver and ushers him into the presence of the great. Him or her or you into the great. And so God bless you and thank you for your giving. And here's what the Bible says right here. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 16. When we give, it opens up opportunities. So when you give to someone else, it opens up an opportunity for a relationship, a friendship. That's just one illustration. The Bible is saying here, this uh, Solomon is saying here in Proverbs, when you make a habit, when you make a lifestyle out of giving, it opens up opportunities. With God, with people, that's just the way life is. It's a very practical scripture. I love you, God bless you, and thank you for giving to our church. Thank you for giving to God and His kingdom through this local ministry. And so you can give in our boxes beside the doors uh, on your way out of the sanctuary. There's a box uh, beside the door, the double glass double glass doors out the foyer. Also, you can text to give, look at our website. There's information in our bulletin on how to give. I love you. God bless you.